This is Inside Geneva. I'm your host, Imogen Folks, and this is a production from Swiss Info, the international public media company of Switzerland. In today's program, it is a weapon of war. It's I, I would say it's a weapon of mass destruction. It is really maximizing harm. I was raped three times. That man raped me. This is the first day. And then after five days, also another one come. Young girls are being raped in front of their parents. Fathers are bound to chairs to be and forced to watch that. Sexual violence happens everywhere in all the conflicts in the world or in other situations of violence. It is really something that is widespread and that we see happening in times of peace and therefore even more in times of conflict. Survivors doubt themselves. Most victims of sexual violence will always question themselves. Am I to blame, etc. They will say, why did you go there? Either they will kill me or they will send me to my parents and they will kill me. And so the mother of three suffers in silence. The stigma prevents many of the victims of sexual abuse from seeking help. It's really, really important to constantly hear, no, you are not to blame and harm has been done to you. Hello and welcome again to Inside Geneva. I'm Imogen Folks. Now, as you may have guessed from those opening voices, today's podcast won't be an easy listen. Conflict-related sexual violence has been with us for as long as war has been with us, forever. But, unlike other atrocities, it has not, until quite recently, received much attention. The early Geneva Conventions didn't mention rape during war, the post-World War II Nuremberg trials did not prosecute anyone for rape, despite receiving harrowing testimony. In 1949, the Fourth Geneva Convention did, at last, clearly prohibit wartime rape and enforced prostitution. And in 1998, the International Tribunal for Rwanda introduced the landmark term genocidal rape to define systematic assaults designed to destroy a particular community. But even now, when the issue of sexual violence in conflict is much more widely recognised, there are very few prosecutions, let alone convictions. And even if there were, those are aimed at punishment of the perpetrators. But what about recovery and reparation for the victims? In today's Inside Geneva, we bring you our final summer profile, where we talk to a woman who has dedicated herself to precisely that, reparation for survivors of sexual violence. My name is Esther Dingemans and I'm the director of the Global Survivors Fund. Our organisation focuses on conflict-related sexual violence and uh, on a particular aspect of that, and that is to ensure that survivors of this type of violence have access to reparation. The organization was um, founded by Nobel uh, Peace Prize laureates, Dr. Dennis Mukwege and Ms. Nadia Murad, and they got the Nobel Peace Prize in 2018 for their fight against sexual violence as a weapon of war. We want to take you now to Oslo, Norway, where the winner of the 2018 Nobel Peace Prize is about to be announced. Let's listen in. Their efforts to end the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war and armed conflict. Dennis McQuaige is the helper who has devoted his life to defending these victims. Nadia Murad is the witness who tells of the abuses perpetrated against herself and others. And it was after they received a Nobel Prize that we set up the organization using that momentum to really put this issue of reparation on the agenda. Tell me a bit about yourself first. I mean, what did you want to be when you were growing up and what, what did you work at before this? I wanted to be a social worker. And um, I studied also uh, educational science slash child psychology. And I actually started working uh, as a social worker in Holland. 
but it was not my profession. I was really affected by the work, working with refugees from around the world who were extremely isolated uh, in, in Holland and uh, very uh, traumatized often. And I felt I couldn't really uh, do much as an individual, but really felt we need a more systemic approach. And that is where I decided to go, uh, to go abroad. That's 25 years ago. I started working in Guinea, Guinea-Conakry, working with um, Liberian and Sierra Leonean refugees, particularly with girls. It was very interesting, actually, because that was the time, to th early, uh, what was it, 2002, when the first reports of sexual violence and exploitation came out. You may remember that. Four young girls at a safe house outside Monrovia, the Liberian capital. Four young girls who've been the victims of sexual violence, whose future chances in life teeter between hope and despair. And uh, often the, the victims of this uh, were, were uh, very honorable girls. And uh, I recall at the time that we did not really use at all the word conflict-related sexual violence. We saw this as sexual exploitation, which, is what, which it was, a form of gender-based violence. But we didn't really ask ourselves the question, why these girls? Why are they the ones being exploited? And uh, digging a little bit deeper, we discovered really these girls have experienced something else. They've experienced slavery by armed groups in Sierra Leone and in Liberia, which had rendered them very, very destitute in a way, with very little self-worth and spat out by their families and, and communities, which actually showed that underlying problem uh, of conflict-related sexual violence. And it was a bit that start of this, uh, of the humanitarian uh, actors looking into this issue. It's interesting you say that that was the start of it. It, it took another 16 years before There were media headlines and a Nobel Peace Prize, particularly related, of course, to what happened in the Democratic Republic of Congo and to Yazidi women. But this is in no way a new phenomenon. Do you think it's been something that's been relegated to pretty low down the agenda of concern of what happens in a war? Absolutely. Of course, we're now 25 years further in time and there is uh, there is resolutions, Security Council resolutions, there is legislation that governs also government's responsibility to, to act on this issue. But it's still a relatively invisible problem, although we know it's happening. So I think sometimes we may also not choose to, 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 to see it. I remember also very well after um, West Africa, I moved on to work in Darfur and I was there for around three years and sexual violence was, uh, it was a characteristic really of the Janjaweed's strategy to really destroy communities. These women are among millions seeking shelter from the fighting in Darfur. However, even in these camps, They constantly face the threat of rape and violence, as do their daughters. It was, in a way, very, very visible. visible. I remember that we were working in the camps and basically at the end of the day, there would be our teams waiting for how many girls came back from collecting firewood having been subjected to, to rape, to gang rape, etc. So we, we couldn't deny that it was happening, but still the attention that it got at the time by the international community is actually really shocking, uh, shocking little. And still, still today, history is repeating itself. In, in Darfur, definitely. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and it's still not making, uh, making headlines. The United Nations says sexual violence is increasingly being used as a weapon of war in Sudan. Attacks have become widespread as the army and paramilitary rapid support forces battle for control. Do you think, I mean, we are two women together, so perhaps we do have some concept of this, but do you think among governments there's a misunderstanding of what sexual violence and conflict actually is? You know, that it's, it's not about sex, it's about power and destruction. Yes, exactly, and that's where the word uh, sexual violence as a weapon of war comes in, because that is really what it is. Not always, can also be incidental, but in most conflict zones you can really draw that conclusion just from looking at the patterns, the numbers, the strategies, the language that comes with it, the targeting of 
uh, often girls of a particular age group. I was just in, in, in Chad, actually. Um, and that, of course, uh, hosts many refugees from Sudan right now. And like, like we just said, history repeating itself. Girls were really saying we have been targeted because of our reproductive age. So that's girls from 13 up to 25. That seems to be the largest group. Um, so it is. It is a weapon of war. It's. I, I would say it's a weapon of mass destruction. It is really um, maximizing harm, not to individuals, but also to their family members, and then to the entire ecosystem around around a person. And unfortunately, uh, quite effective because the the harms are really long lasting and incredibly profound. I know you've just come back from Gaziantep in. Turkey. Can you tell me a little bit, kind of practically, tell our listeners what you do on one of these field missions? Sure, sure. This was um, because I was uh, looking at a, a project that the Global Survivors Fund is supporting there. We support national actors, often uh, local uh, NGOs, that are working with survivors of sexual violence. In Gaziantep, these are survivors of sexual violence, either committed by ISIS but most often by the Syrian regime in the detention centers. It has been two years, but Fawzia Khalaf says she can't forget watching government soldiers rape and kill four of her daughters. So these are refugees that have fled Syria and they are now uh, in Gaziantep and surrounding cities. So our work is around reparation. Maybe I can just uh, explain a little bit about that. So reparation is in fact a right. It is a right of uh, for every person that has suffered a human rights violation. And um, what it can take different shapes. It can take the form of that's the most known is, is financial compensation, but it's much more than that. It's also about rehabilitation, so medical services, psychological services, but also uh, acknowledgement. What is really important, particularly for survivors of sexual violence that is often surrounded by so much shame and stigma, is to, to be a knowledge that harm has been done to them and that it was not their fault. So our work evolves around convincing governments, actually, to take up the responsibility to set up what we call domestic reparation programs to provide all of these measures to survivors of human rights violations. However, there's also governments that are not there yet and it's very unlikely that in the foreseeable future they will take up their responsibility. And that is where Syria comes in. It, it, in, in, the, in the next period, we will not see a national reparation program in Syria. So what we then do is we support uh, civil society organizations in providing what we call interim reparative measures. So they very much look like reparation. It's about financial compensation, livelihood support, education, psychological care, fistula operations but also commemoration initiatives, so that acknowledgement, while we continue to push at an international level for, for government action. So our project there is, supports 800 uh, survivors of sexual violence, many of them men, but also women, and often they have experienced years and years of sexual violence and other forms of torture. So you were talking about the importance just of acknowledgement, and it's interesting, I have interviewed a few survivors of torture mm. and many of them have said to me, almost like the first step towards some form of healing is to sit down with somebody who says, what happened to you was wrong. Yeah. Is that an experience you have as well in your work? Yeah, and I think it's something very common, not only in my work, but for all victims of sexual violence, no matter where, whether it is in conflict or in peace settings, Survivors doubt themselves. Um, you, most victims of sexual violence will always question themselves. Am I to blame, etc.? And it's really, really important to constantly hear, no, you are not to blame and harm has been done to you. And that can be particularly important when the perpetrator was, for example, uh, of an enemy group. If we look at Ukraine at the moment, that really resonates what you just said with what I hear from survivors in Ukraine. They need to hear the harm has been done to you, which will also help them to protect themselves from being accused of being 
used but also siding with the enemy somehow. A quiet rural neighborhood shattered by barbaric violence. A soldier entered our house. My husband and I were there. At gunpoint, he took me to a neighboring house. He was ordering me, take your clothes off or I'll shoot you. Then he started raping me. And maybe just on the on, on that one, so it's very important that they hear this, not only from first responders, but also publicly. And uh, in that respect, I think the first lady of Ukraine, Olena Zelenska, is a good example because she understood this. And very su- early in the conflict, she spoke out publicly on TV, on conferences, saying exactly that. You're heard, you're not to blame, and you have the right... Uh, to be supported, the right to compensation. We're actually working with Ukrainian government on providing compensation, financial compensation, to survivors, uh, which is also not only about the material aspect, right? It is also about that message. Harm has been done to you, and therefore we are supporting you, compensating you. I can imagine the reparation, though, must also help towards healing some of the long-term consequences because you know you often think okay you're attacked or you're you're injured or you're raped in war and that happens on a day and then it's over but it's just not like that at all is it no the 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 patterns are of sexual violence are particularly brutal i would say Uh, And that is exactly with the intention to create maximum impact or maximum harm. So what that means, it means that young girls are being raped in front of their parents, that fathers are bound to chairs and forced to watch that, or that uh, an older woman woman in her 80s is raped in front of her uh, son-in-law. And this reminds me actually of someone who told me exactly that in, in Congo. Um, So the scars are really profound, the psychological scars, because it does it does a lot in a family when when that happens. And then there's, of course, sexual slavery. We work with girls that um, were victims of Boko Haram. Boko Haram, roughly translated, it means Western education is a sin. In April, it snatched around 276 schoolgirls from the northeastern town of Chibok. While dozens have escaped, more than 200 are still in captivity, nearly six months later. And they were often taken into captivity at a very young age and stayed in captivity for years. So then we talk about years and years of of, of rape, but also other hardship. Same for the Yazidi community. So it is rare that it is an incidental rape. And of course, there is no hierarchy in in harms. But yes, the the scars last sometimes generations. There's entire generations that are born from rape who often suffer also, again, the same stigmatization that their mothers did. You did say earlier that reparation doesn't necessarily always mean money. It can be a lot of different things. It is difficult for survivors to talk and be open about what happened to them. But when you do talk to them, what do they say they want? Because surely that must be the most important thing is for them to to steer their, their future. Yeah. And you're saying something very crucial there, and that is for them to steer. Because reparation is not only about, let's say, the the product. It's also about the process. And survivors of sexual violence have oft have been stripped of all autonomy, right? So for them to be really engaging in the process of defining what should reparation actually look like is really important. Maybe I can share with you the example of Nigeria. So we work in Nigeria with girls that were um, held captive by Boko Haram. And we ask them, or our partners, I should say, uh, the question, like, what does reparation look like for you? And they said, for us, it's about education. They were captured because they were going to school. That was part of Boko Haram's uh, ideology. So for them, going back to school, um, they were saying going back to school is a form of reparation because it shows our defiance towards Boko Haram. So like that, it can be very different in every context. And that's, I think, important. Ask survivors, what does it mean for you? There will be commonalities, but there is also very different Uh, desires by different survivor groups. The first time I heard about 
systematic rape as a weapon of war was when I was starting out in journalism, and that was in Bosnia. We hear more about it now. Do you think it's happening more, or are we simply more aware? I think it is very hard to give an exact answer to that question, in all fairness, but I would lean towards we are more aware. It's true that there is hardly any conflict that I can think of where sexual violence has not been used. But I do think it is because we now have it on our radar, and which is a positive thing when there is a conflict. There are now uh, activists, but also governments, that ask themselves the question, what happened to the women? And to the men, because of course sexual violence can affect men and boys as well. So I think we are more aware. I also fear that we're only seeing a tip of the iceberg still. It's extremely hard still today for a survivor to come forward and and seek help. Maybe just coming back to, to Chad, I was there a few weeks ago and we were talking with victims of sexual violence from Sudan, quite uh, young girls, teenage girls, and some of them told us that they had not spoken to anyone yet about what had happened to them. They had not had received any medical care, and one girl said that her parents didn't even know. They're really, really still trying to hide it, um, fearing retaliation, fearing the consequences that it will have on their family, on their status, etc., I mean, fearing they might be isolated for the rest of their lives, maybe. Yes, and and that is exactly which which unfortunately is is sometimes a reality. I do want to add there the other side, and that is that we see that survivors, some survivors, are actually more outspoken than they were twenty years ago. And um, for me, actually, an eye-opening moment here was. Panzi Hospital in DRC in Congo, of which Dr. Dennis Mugwega, our founder, uh, who we spoke about, is the medical director. And when I first came to that hospital, I was really struck by the fact that survivors there of sexual violence were standing on stage, taking the microphone and saying, yes, I've been raped. And yes, this is a child. This is my child. And she's born of rape. But I'm proud of her and I'm proud of myself. And I had not in all of these years working with survivors in any other context. I had seen that, um, yeah, that power also and that space that survivors took, but also thanks to a very enabling environment. And that's a positive thing. I think we're seeing that more and more. And in our work, we really try also to uh, support survivor networks and create that space so they can amplify their their own voices. Going forward then, what what key things would you like to see? Starting... um, Apart from men stopping doing this. That, first of all, that would be a very good thing. And I think there is actually a lot of work to be done. It's not the area where we work on masculinities and gender norms directly, but it is really important work all around the world, not limited to conflict settings. Of course, ending impunity. We, we, it, it ha- we, at some point, this impunity has to be stopped. Unfortunately, we are seeing the contrary. We just spoke about Sudan, uh, the history repeating itself which actually is very much linked to reparation as well, because one form of reparation is guarantees of non-repetition. But what we saw in Sudan was the opposite. It was actually a guarantee of of crimes committed again, because the Janjawi, the perpetrators at the time, were principally upgraded into the the, um, Sudanese army. So full impunity. I think there was a handful of court cases on sexual violence committed in Darfur with fewer fewer successful convictions, if any at all. And this is around the world. We see it in Guatemala, we see it in Nepal, we see it everywhere. So that's one, one very big thing. Of course, because of our work, but I also truly believe in reparation. I listen to survivors over and over again saying this is something that we need to focus on. It is something that we're not looking at right now enough. It's usually still more about the prevention and the response, but that essential part of reparation, being heard, being compensated, enabling people to rebuild their lives, that is something that I think we're making gains, but there's still a lot of work to do there. A 
a lot of work indeed. My thanks to Esther Dingemans for sharing with us everything she and her colleagues are doing. If you have been affected by what you heard today and would like to contact the Global Survivors Fund, you can find them at www.globalsurvivorsfund.org. And if you want to comment or review this or any other episode of Inside Geneva, you can do that wherever you get your podcasts or write to us at insidegeneva at swissinfo.ch. Don't forget to tune in next week for a special edition from the World Trade Organization, where we hear why re-globalization is the new buzzword and why WTO officials think better, fairer trade can benefit all of us from closing the poverty gap to tackling climate change. I'm Imogen Folks. Thanks again for joining us on Inside Geneva. A reminder, you've been listening to Inside Geneva, a Swiss Info production. You can email us on insidegeneva at swissinfo.ch and subscribe to us and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Check out our previous episodes, how the International Red Cross unites prisoners of war with their families, or why survivors of human rights violations turn to the UN in Geneva for justice. I'm Imogen Folks. Thanks again for listening. Get ready to explore the crossroads of innovation and entrepreneurship. Listen to our latest series of the Swiss Connection podcast, where we dive into the fascinating parallels between Switzerland and Silicon Valley. Switzerland and Silicon Valley are hubs of cutting edge research and groundbreaking innovation. But what makes Silicon Valley the pinnacle of entrepreneurial culture and investment? Join our journalists, Marc-André Miseret and Sarah Ibrahim, as they venture into the heart of Silicon Valley. They sit down with Swiss-born entrepreneurs to uncover what Switzerland can learn from the world's tech capital. Get inspired by real stories from leading innovators in technology. Listen and subscribe to the Swiss Connection's latest series now, available wherever you get your podcasts.